Hey guys, in the preceding lecture what we're going to be talking about is the actual optics and the actual human anatomy and physiology of the actual eye itself. This is your eyeball here. Um, we've done a variety of activities with the actual eye in this unit from doing the eyeball dissection to looking at our visual perception through a variety of activities that we traveled around and uh, we went from station to station. And then finally what we did in this unit is we were able to look at the actual optics of the human eye and figure out how things are processed on the actual back of the eyeball. And then if we have some type of misshapen eyeball, what type of lenses that we need to have uh, in order to correct those particular uh, misshapenness of our actual eyeball itself. So the first thing we're going to take a look at here is how the image is actually processed on the back of the eye. When you take a look at the following diagram that I'm showing you, you can see that when we look at this individual's head here, as light comes off this individual's head here, the individual head becomes upside down. So we can see this individual's hair went from here to on the back of the eye, it's actually upside down. Not only is it upside down on the back of the eye, but it's also inverted. And what, mean, what it means by being inverted is what was once right is now left, which once was left is now right. And the image has basically been flipped uh, when we take a look at it. So what we have to take a look at now is how is this image then going to be able to be processed in your actual occipital lobe? Well, we know that that right and left difference is taken care of because the optic nerves cross in the actual eye at the optic chiasma. When we did the actual brain dissection itself, we saw that there was an Xing pattern of the actual optic nerves themselves to where the right eye, that optic nerve goes on to the left side of the brain, and where the left eye, that optic nerve goes on to the actual right side of the brain. Now this upside downness that we see on the back of the eye is going to be taken care of because these neurons that are located here on the back of the eye, where this individual's head is located as hairline is located at, it's going to hook up on the occipital lobe at a higher point than this area here. So this individual's neck is going to hook up at a lower point on the occipital lobe. This individual's hairline is going to hook up at a higher point. So they basically kind of crisscross and go in opposite directions to take care of that upside downness of the actual image being processed on the, on the eye. This is why you don't see things upside down, because of how these neurons actually hook up onto the actual occipital lobe and the crisscrossing that we have uh, of the optic nerves at the optic chiasma to take care of that right and leftness that we talk about. We take a look at the eye itself. 70% um, of all sensory receptors are located in the eye. Each eye has over a million nerve fibers that are associated with it. So you can see our nervous system has dedicated a ton of neurons to the eyeball itself. It's a very important organ of the actual human body because it allows us per to perceive things from the external environment. We have to protect this organ. Um, the way that we protect the eye is we put it in a bony orbit. So when you take a look at your eye, it's kind of enclosed and not completely enclosed in bone, but it's protected in bone in this actual bony orbit itself. Then if we look at the back side of the eye, it's protected by an actual fat pad itself to help, help cushion it in this bony orbit that it's located in. So if you do get hit in the eye, you kind of have like a pillow-like cushioning with this actual uh with this actual adipose tissue that's located on the actual back of the eye itself. The first thing we're going to take a look at is the accessory structures of the actual eye. So these are structures that are surrounding the actual eyeball and to help protect it, to lubricate it, um, and just a variety of things and to help move the eyeball. So we're going to take a look at the eyelids and the eyelashes, the conjunctiva, the lacrimal apparatus, and the extrinsic eye muscles. And like I said, these are all accessory structures that are associated with the eyeball itself. When you take a look, what we're going to take a look at first is the eyelids and the eyelashes. These are the eyelids that are located here. At the edge of the eyelids, you have a gland. So at the edge of the eyelids, you have a gland that's called the tarsal gland. The tarsal gland is not an endocrine gland, it's an exocrine gland. So it releases its products into ducts, and these ducts travel to the surface of the eyeball. The fluid that the tarsal gland is going to secrete is going to be a lubricant fluid to allow the eyelid to glide freely across the actual eyeball. If you didn't have these lubricating fluids that are going to be dispersed on your eye, you're going to have a lot of friction that's going to build up, and actually when your eyelid would close, you could actually burn your eyeball from all this friction that's developing. So this lubricant is going to help deter the friction that would build up on the eye if you didn't have a lubricant located there. 
So this is called the tarsal gland that's located at the edge of the eyelid. Now in between each one of these eyelashes themselves, you have another gland. These eyelash, in between these eyelashes, you have a gland that's called the ciliary gland. And the ciliary gland is going to do a very similar thing to the tarsal gland and that it's going to release also a lubricant for the actual eyeball so your eyeball stays nice and moist so when these eyelids collapse on top of it, it reduces the actual friction buildup on the inside of it. So as you can see here guys, here's your eyelids and eyelashes. These are the tarsal glands. They're going to be at the edge of the eyelids and they're going to produce a lubricant for the eye as well as the ciliary glands are located in between each of the eyelashes and they're also going to produce this lubricant to help reduce the friction. If we take a look at the actual inside of the eyelid, so I take that eyelid and I flip it up on the other side, there's a membrane. This membrane is called the conjunctiva uh, or the conjunctivia, some people will call it. But the conjunctiva, guys, is also going to fuse with the surface of the actual cornea itself. Now, sometimes you can get a bacterial infunction of the conjunctiva, and this is what we call pink eye. Uh, many of you have probably had pink eye before, but this is a bacterial infection of the actual conjunctiva. It's also called conjunctivitis. This conjunctiva is also going to secrete a lubricant. It's a more of a snotty-like, mucus-like um, lubricant that it's going to produce, but it's also going to help reduce friction on the surface of the eyeball itself as well. You can see here, guys, this is the actual conjunctiva right here that's located at, and you can see it actually fuses with the actual cornea itself right here on the actual eyeball itself. So you can see if this were to get infected, you'd have that pink eye and your eyes would be all red. Now another structure that we're going to take a look at is the actual lacrimal apparatus. And this is the lacrimal apparatus is hanging out on the lateral portion of your eyeball. Note, the lacrimal apparatus is on the lateral portion of your eye. A lacrimal apparatus, lateral portion of your eye. Note the lacrimal gland is not located, guys, is not located on the medial side of your eye. It's located on the lateral side of your eye. This is mostly going to produce, what this actually produces is your actual tears themselves. We call it lacrimal fluid. So lacrimal fluid is going to be produced here. This is another exocrine gland. It's going to release its products directly on the surface of the eyeball. And it's going to drain across your eye here and then go to these little tiny canals that eventually drain their ways into your actual nose itself. Now the difference between the tears that are produced, this lacrimal fluid that we call tears, is these tears actually contain antibodies. Um, these antibodies and lysosomes are part of your immune system. Um, so if you get like a bacterium or a virus tries to invade your actual eye, you have these antibodies and lysosomes to help take, that, take it out and to uh, prevent you from getting sick. This always doesn't work for the most, most of the time. Um, these antibodies and lysosomes do a great job and are able to... Uh, and are able to fight off that particular foreign invader itself. So remember, the lacrimal gland is going to produce these actual tears themselves. These tears drain and make their way into your actual nasal cavity. Now, during an emotional response time, whether you're laughing or you begin to cry, this lacrimal gland overproduces these tears. These tears can't all drain simultaneously into this little tiny canal. So what these tears do is they begin to overflow the actual eyelid itself and they begin to come down. So then you begin to cry. Um, in that particular case, you have these tears of crying or it could be tears of joy. You may also notice during your emotional response too, you get the sniffle. So when you begin to cry, you begin to cry and you can uh, get the sniffles that tend to look like that because you have an excess production of this lacrimal fluid or these tears that are going to actually drain into the actual nasal cavity itself. And you're going to have that runny nose type feeling with the actual lacrimal gland itself. So remember, the lacrimal gland is on the lateral portion of the eye. It's going to produce these tears that we call lacrimal fluid. The lacrimal fluid is going to contain antibodies and lysosomes that are part of your immune response. So this is the function of the lacrimal apparatus. It's also called the lacrimal gland. It's going to protect, moisten, lubricates the eye, and it empties its products directly into the actual nasal cavity. These are what the lacrimal fluid or the tears are made of. It's a dilute salt solution, and then it contains antibodies and lysosomes all those other fluids that we talked about associated with the eye are, are for lubricant purposes only, whereas this one actually has an immune property that's associated with it. 
we take a look at the eye muscles. You have six muscles that are associated with the eye. These six muscles are going to allow your eye to move in a variety of directions. Remember, we talked about a cow. A cow only has four muscles associated with a with a with its particular eye. So if you if you a cow were to hear something like off in the distance, like moo 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 off over here, a cow would physically have to turn its head to be able to see what's actually going on. Whereas we having six muscles associated with our eye, if we hear like yak 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 yak, we can kind of turn our heads or turn our eyeballs a little bit and be able to see out of our periphery what's actually going on because we can kind of turn our actual eyes to look that particular way. So we have six muscles associated with our eye. We need that cow eye dissection. A cow only has four muscles that are associated with its eye. These are the muscles of the eye that you can take a look at here. I don't expect you on your test guys to know the names of all six muscles. Just know that we have six muscles that are associated with our eye. If you're going to be an ophthalmologist, an optician, or optometrist, these are the muscles of the eye and this is what they do. On your test, guys, I don't expect you to know all these muscles of the actual eye, but you can if you want to. We take a look at the eyeball itself. We dissected an eyeball in class. We dissected a cow eye in class. And when we took a look at the actual cow eye, it's composed of three layers. We have the outer layer that's called the fibrous layer. We have a middle layer that's called the vascular layer. And then we have an inner layer that's called the sensory layer. The fibrous layer is going to be this outer layer that's here. It consists of the sclera which is the white portion of your eye that's right here. And then the sclera fuses on the front with what we call the cornea. The cor cornea is this front portion of your eye that's transparent that light goes through. So this is the cornea, and then the white of your eye is called the sclera. This is an important image. I would know that this image in and out for your test, you will have a very similar image on your actual test itself. But you can see, this is this outer portion we call the fibrous layer. This fibrous layer consists of the sclera, which is the white of the eye. And then the front of the sclera, we find this transparent portion that we call the cornea. The cornea is an interesting tissue in your body because your cornea is the only tissue in your whole entire body that can be transplanted without fear of rejection. So we can see, this is the sclera, is the white part of your eye. There will be a multiple choice question asking you about the white portion of the eye is referred to as the, and you should be able to answer sclera. The cornea is the transparent central portion of the eye. It allows for light to pass through it. It repairs itself relatively easily. And then, like I said earlier, it's the only human tissue that can be transplanted without fear of rejection. We take a look now at the middle layer of the eye. In the middle of the layer eye is the vascular layer. I should have wrote vascular layer up here. But the vascular layer consists of the choroid. Um, which is a, uh, a blood-rich nutritive layer in the posterior of the eye, and it contains a pigment that prevents actual light from, from scattering. We also have the ciliary body, and we also have the iris. The ciliary body is a smooth muscle that attaches to the lens that allows the lens to bend and flex and get things in focus. Remember, the bending and the flexing of the lens in order to get something in focus is called an accommodation. The iris is the color portion of your eye. When you say you have blue eyes, you have green eyes, that's the iris that you're looking at. That hole in the iris is called the pupil. The iris is a smooth muscle, and this is what we talk about with your pupillary reflex. Under low light conditions, that smooth muscle is going to open up. Under high light conditions, that smooth muscle is going to close to let light, let light, let light, let light, let less light in. Because we want to let less light in during... Uh, during uh, low light conditions, I mean during high light conditions, you want to let low, less light in um, due to the fact that we don't want a high amount of light hitting the actual back of the actual retina itself. Because if a high amount of light were to actually hit the actual retina itself, it would actually burn the actual retina and you wouldn't be able to see. If you take a look at these structures that are located here, you can see that right here is the actual choroid. So when I look right here, this is the choroid that's right here. This is that blood-rich layer that's right here of the actual choroid, and it's also dark in pigment to prevent light from actual scattering itself. When I take a look at the actual front here of the choroid, I'm able to see this structure that's hanging down right here. This is your ciliary body, and the ciliary body is a set of muscles that ligaments attach to that attach to the lens, but these are going to bend and flex that lens in order to get light to come in and actually hit the back of the retina. So that's what the actual ciliary body does. The ciliary body is going to bend and flex that particular lens in order to get things in actual focus itself. When I move to the front of the ciliary body, I see this smooth muscle that's located right here. This smooth muscle that's located right here 
is referred to as the iris. The iris is the colored portion of your actual eye itself. So this is the actual iris itself. The hole in the iris that's located right here is the pupil. And remember, we have the pupillary reflex that's going to control light coming in to the actual eye. Remember, if it's under high light conditions, this pupil is going to decrease in size. If it's under low light conditions, this pupil is going to increase in size. There's another two fluids I also want to point out at this point. This fluid that's located in front of the lens is called the aqueous humor that's located here. This fluid that's located behind the lens is called the vitreous humor. So you have the aqueous humor and the vitreous humor. These two types of humor are going to allow the actual eyeball itself to keep its interocular pressure. The aqueous humor is a lot more fluid-like. The vitreous humor is a lot more snotty-like that's located back here. But it's also going to provide nutrients for the actual cornea itself when we take a look at the aqueous humor. When we take a look at the actual sensory layer of the eye, it contains the retina. So the retina is the very sensory layer of the eye, the actual inner layer of the actual eyeball itself. And we take a look at this particular layer of the eye. Um, this is going to contain two types of photoreceptor cells. The first type of photoreceptor cell we have is the rods. The second type of photoreceptor cell we have is the cones. Rods pick up gray tones of light. Cones pick up color. There is an area in the back of the eye where we don't have any of these photoreceptors. It's called the optic disc or the blind spot. When light hits the blind spot, you're not able to see that particular image at all. So you can't see that image when light hits that particular blind spot because there is no photoreceptors that are located in that given location of the actual eyeball. You guys went to a station when we did the actual visual perception. And that station number two, you were taking a look and measuring out where your actual blind spot at when you were taking a look at that X and you moved it in and eventually that circle disappeared on the other side. Um, that's when you're taking a look at your actual blind spot. When light hits this area, you do not process that visual image there because there is no photoreceptors that are there. Let me take a look at the actual rods themselves. The rods contain uh, are located mostly in your peripheral vision and they're going to pick up gray tones of light. The cones are going to pick up color vision, and they're located mostly towards the back of your eye. There is an area on the very back of your eye that contains the greatest density of cones, and we call this area the fovea centralis. Remember, we talked a little bit about there's no photoreceptor cells that are located at where the optic nerve comes in, and that is called the blind spot. We take a look at cones. Different cones are sensitive to different wavelengths of light. And then we have a mixing of these different wavelengths of light is what's going to produce actual color that you see. If you're lacking a particular cone due to genetic purposes, we call this color blindness. So a lack of one particular type of cone is called color blindness. These are the wavelengths of light that we have. We have blue cones, green cones, and red cones. And then we have a, a mixing of these wavelengths of light is what's going to allow us to see the visible light that we're able to perceive. We take a look at the lens. The lens is a biconvex crystal-like structure, and it's held in place by these ligaments that are attached to the ciliary body. Remember, the ciliary body is part of the actual vascular layer of your actual eye, and it's going to bend and flex that lens. The bending and flexing of that lens in order to get something in focus is called an accommodation. So do not forget that term. Accommodation is that bending and flexing of the lens in order to get something in focus. Again, here's another diagram of the eye. This is a very important diagram. I would know the ins and outs of this diagram. This is the lens that's located right here. Now, you can have a disorder that happens over time with this actual lens itself. This lens becomes opaque and cloudy with like a protein-like deposit that actually occurs on the actual lens over time. I'm not quite sure what actually causes this, but this is what we call the cataract. So a cataract is going to be, you're going to get some type of film that's going to develop on this particular lens, and now light cannot shine through the actual lens itself. If light can't shine through that lens, you can't process it on your actual retina itself. If you can't process it on your actual retina itself, you can't see. Another thing I want to point out in this image, this is that fovea centralis that we talked about a little bit earlier with the actual retina itself. This is when light hits it, you have your greatest visual acuity when light comes on here. The only way for light to hit that fovea centralis is for you to look head on at something. You can't have light hit the fovea centralis by using your peripheral vision. Your peripheral vision is mostly rods. This is a cataract, and this is when that lens becomes hard and opaque with age. Vision becomes hazy and distorted. Eventually, this is going to lead to blindness in the affected eye. 
How do we fix a cataract? Is we physically have to go in and remove the lens, and a lot of times then doctors will put a plastic lens in its place. Um, a lot of times the elderly are scared to death to have cataract surgery because you're physically cutting into the actual eyeball itself, which can be kind of a scary thing. But once they cut into the eye, they put a new lens in. Um, there's a few weeks that they have to wear sunglasses with, with to allow their uh, to allow their iris to be able to heal itself through it so they're able to uh, have that pupillary reflex. But then things tend to go a lot better for them and they're able to have that vision back that they once had. Your animals can also get cataracts as well. You may have had a cat or a dog that's had to have cataract surgery. This is what a cataract looks like. You can see the lens here, this opaqueness, this cloudiness that's associated with it. We take a look at two chambers. We take a look at the aqueous humor and the vitreous humor. I talked about these two types of fluid that are located in the eye. Now sometimes this fluid doesn't drain properly. If this fluid doesn't drain properly in the actual eyeball itself, then you can get something that's called glaucoma. And glaucoma is a buildup of the aqueous or vitreous humor in the actual eye, and now you have intense amount of pressure in your eye, and because you have this intense amount of pressure that's in your actual eye, it can actually destroy the retina. Uh, what a lot of times doctors will do in the case when you have this glaucoma is they'll go in and these cells that are producing the aqueous and vitreous humor is they'll cauterize them so they actually produce a lot less fluid and because they produce a lot less fluid then that decreases the actual pressure build up in your actual eye. That's one way that they're able to take care of if you have uh, an abundant production of this aqueous or vitreous humor or you don't have proper draining of this particular type of fluid. And so actually just go in and cauterize those cells or some of those cells that are producing this type of fluid. There's your aqueous humor. Remember, your aqueous or aqueous humor tends to be a lot more fluid-like. Your vitreous humor tends to be a lot more snotty-like and has a thicker consistency to it. The final thing we talked about on the last day, guys, we got out these eyeball models and we begin to look at the images and lenses um, that are associated with different shaped eyeballs. If I have a normal shaped eyeball and the image is processed correctly on the back of the eye, I have what's called an emetropic eyeball. And that means that this image is clear no matter whether I'm looking at something far away or close up, I'm able to see things correctly. And a myopic eye, we call it nearsightedness. An individual that's nearsighted can see things close up, but they can't see things far away. And the reason being is because their eyeball tends to be too long. Because their eyeball is too long, the image is actually processed in front of the eye, and they have to get what's called a divergent lens or a minus lens. It's also called a concave lens that they get. So a myopic person has an eyeball that's too long. They need a minus lens. Um, it's also called a concave lens and it's the divergent lens as well. So a myopic eyeball is too long, they're called nearsighted. And hyperopia, they're farsighted. They don't have an eyeball that's too long, they have an eyeball that's too short. So the image is actually processed behind the actual retina itself, and they have to get a convex lens, which is also a plus lens, which is also uh, a convergent lens, is what they're gonna have to get for their particular eye itself. Most of the time it's because their eyeball is too short, and sometimes it can also be because their lens is actually lazy. These are the different types of lenses that you need for these different types of shaped eyeballs that we have here that you can see. This is a good image that kind of explains the whole process. Here's your normal shaped eyeball, here's your myopic eye, and here's your hyperopic eye, and then the lenses that are required to correct that particular disorder. You can see where the image is processed on a person that's hyperopic. It's going to be behind the actual retina itself, and in order to correct that, we're going to have to give the individual a plus lens and then this is going to bring this image actual forward so it comes to a solid point on the back of the retina so they get a convex lens or a plus lens it's also called a convergent lens myopic eye we can see the image is processed in front of the retina because the eyeball is too long they get a minus lens which is a concave lens and then this is going to allow or a divergent lens which is going to allow this light ray to spread out more and then come to a solid point on the back of the retina and astigmatism is a misshapen cornea. With a misshapen cornea, then you have all different focal points of light. And I might be looking at like two lines that have a space between them if I have an astigmatism, but I can't see the space between them. It comes as a solid line. A person with an astigmatism, a lot of times they just get a, a contact that molds to the surface of their eye to prevent this light from actually scattering. This is what an astigmatism is. These are the major disorders or homeostatic imbalances that we can have with the eye. We can have night blindness. This is inhibited rod function. 
Um, due to your diet, you're not getting proper nutrients that you need that are found in things like vegetables, like carrots and stuff like that. And that prevents your actual rods from being able to function so you can't see at night. Color blindness is due a genetic condition where you're actually lacking the actual particular type of cone. And we talked a little bit about a cataract is when this lens actually becomes hard opaque and we're not able to see because of that. And then the final thing is glaucoma, which is this increased pressure within the actual eyeball itself. So that concludes the actual eyeball, uh, the eyeball lecture itself. This is the structure that we've talked about throughout this whole entire lecture. This is the lacrimal gland. The sclera is this white portion of the eye. You can see the eye muscles that are located here. The optic nerve that's located back here on the back portion of the actual eye itself. You can see the cornea on the front of the eye itself. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to stop by, see me in class um, before the actual test itself. Um, I'm available in the morning or after school. Um, just let me know um, when you need help with the actual uh, with the actual learning of the actual eye. I also gave you a study guide. I would recommend looking over your notes, looking at that study guide, and then all the activities that we did in class. I wish you the best of luck on this upcoming test.